So in the previous presentation, Tamer talked about how to build a PLI application using interest and data packets, right? The um, consumer or whoever wants to get the PLI information send an interest to get the data. However, sometimes the data may be generated in an unpredictable way. You don't know the time step. You don't know when it's going to be generated. So what do you do in that situation? Now, we, we have a solution. It is called SYNC. We can use this module in NDN to retrieve data that is dynamically produced and um, they can contain some names that you cannot predict. Okay, so that's the introduction. I want to talk about what NBN Sync is, why do we need it, and what are some of the design issues, and then give you an example of a single protocol for a mobile ad hoc network that's relevant to the topics today. Okay. And what is NBNC? It is a new transfer service for data centric networking, for example, NBN. So we're all familiar with, I assume everyone is familiar with TCP, right? So if you want to get some data, you create a TCP socket, you, you just try to send the data to the TCP socket, that's done. You know the data will be delivered. This is something we want to create that's similar to TCP, but it works for NDN. And it's built on top of the TC, sorry, of the um, interest and data packets. Sync is on top of that interest and data abstraction. We don't want to, to worry about uh, finding the exact name of the interest of the data. We want the sync protocol to deal with that. And your application simply create a sync socket, just like a TCP socket. Then it can know what's the next data packet that will be generated, and then you fetch it. OK, so what does sync do exactly? It synchronizes the namespace of the shared data for applications you are designing. OK, so what does that mean? For example, if you have multiple users that are in a chat group, just like soldiers, carrier, and um, commander, they are in one chat group, and they want to synchronize their chat messages. This is a shared data set. They want to share this data set. So sync will allow them to know what chat messages they're missing, and then uh, they can fetch it. The application will fetch it. Basically, sync will send out sync messages that says, uh, let's say, what, sync, uh, what chat messages I have, and it will tell the application, I mean, when this message arrives at the other users, the other users will know what they have, but you don't have. Then they will tell you, you're missing this message. Then my application can fetch this message. Okay, so at a high level, that's what sync means. Okay. What's the benefit of doing this? So here, it's very different from TCP. TCP basically does a point-to-point -point synchronization. So point A wants to synchronize with point B. Point B wants to synchronize with point A. They know each other's IP addresses. They basically fetch all the data produced by the, the, those two nodes, right? So that's TCP. But here, we don't focus on a specific node. We want to get all the data produced by this group, okay? It can be two users, can be three users, can be n users. So whoever is in that group, I just want your message. So that's multi-party communication. So we're not just focusing on two nodes 
involved in the TCP communication. We're interested in anything produced by this group. Okay, that's multi-party communication. And also, the application, your application doesn't have to worry about what are the IP addresses of individual participants and how to reach them. And the related benefit is the data can be fetched from any node. So here is an example. So uh, remember in the previous slide, they were asking questions. Am I missing some messages? Or do you have some chat messages I don't have? OK, so here's a soldier with a mobile phone that just produced a new chat message. And that phone is going to answer the question. It's going to say, here's a new chat message I just generated. This is all sync. Sync is doing all this. Um, and this sync message will, um, will be delivered to everyone that has asked the question. OK, so the other users will receive it. Anybody who asks the question will receive it. So basically, it's a one to multi party communication. And then, even if a user moves out of the range of this mobile phone, it can still receive it from that user that just got the message. Because that, uh, the user that's ju that just moved will also send a question that asks, Am I missing something? And then it will receive the information from that laptop. So that means this kind of communication is very resilient to mobility and intermittent connectivity. Okay, so that is what Think does. Question is exactly how do we achieve this kind of multi-party communication. First, the first thing you do, the SYNC protocol does, is to encode the data set or the entire set of data names into one compact format. So here I have the example. So remember in the first picture I showed, everyone is asking a question, right? Do you have some message I don't have? How do they ask the question? They send this message, this interest, with the name of the sync group. In here, I have the name sync slash chat room two. Sorry, it should be chat room one. Um, they should all be listening on, in the same sync prefix. And each of them just attach their data set state to that sync group name, then they send this out. This is a question basically asking, um, I have this data set with this state. Do you have something different from my data set? Right? So if someone has a different set of data, basically that means they have some more messages or they are missing some messages. Right? So then they can use this state information that encoded in the name to detect the differences in their data set. So next, the question is, how do you encode the state of the data set? There are different ways to do it. And I'm going to show you two examples. The uh, ultimate goal is to make the comparison between the data sets very fast, without a lot of overhead. And there are other questions. For example, do you want to compare the data set between just pairs, between A and B, and then B and C, then C and D? Or you want to do the comparison between every node and every other node in the group? So these are different design choices. And our different sync protocols the, they, they make different design decisions. And then there's another design decision. Do you think both the names and the data? So for example, TCP. TCP thinks 
both the name and the data, right? TCP. If TCP detects that it's missing a sequence number, it's going to fetch that data for you, for the application. However, you can separate them. You can design a transfer layer protocol that only thinks the name and then that let the application decide whether that piece of data is useful or not. And here, there are two design decisions. So our sync protocols can just sync only names and then tell the application, do you want this piece of name with data or not? And then the application can make a decision. This is very useful for, for example, for the PLI application, right? So for the PLI application, the application only cares about the latest data. So if you learn that uh, you are missing some data that has already expired, it happened 10 minutes ago, then there's no need for the application to fetch it, right? So in that case, even if SYNC discovers this difference, the application may not care about it. In TCP's case, it's going to fetch the data no matter what. But in our case, we can separate these two. Let the SYNC just discover the missing pieces and let the application decide whether to fetch it or not. So you can do the syncing of the names and data separately, or you can do both. I mean, the sync protocol can do both. So there's a design decision there. And in the mobile ad hoc environment, actually, that that is very uh, that is something we need to pay attention to. I will talk about that later. Okay. So now I will give you one uh, concrete example of a sync protocol. It's something we designed early in the NDS project. It's called Chronosync, and it's designed within. Um, Designed specifically for mobile ad hoc network. It's just for any network in general. So you can see what, what the design looks like. First of all, we um, let each node uh, name its data, pick its own name prefix, and then use a sequence number to identify uh, the data, specific data. Okay, so for example, node A has yeah, is using the prefix slash A and its current sequence number is 100. It has generated data from 0 to 100. Okay, so node B has data from uh, under the name slash B and it has generated data from 0 to 50. Okay, so this can represent different chat, uh, chat group users, right? So node A is a chat user, node B is in the same group. And they have, node A has produced 100 chat messages, and node B has produced 50 chat messages, right? And um, everyone in this chat group, they have their view of who has produced what. So this is from one node's point of view. This node, maybe node A, thinks these are the state information at every node. Another node, node B, may have a slightly different view. Okay, so their goal is to synchronize or reconcile their view of their shared data set. Okay, so what do they do? They compute a digest over the set of names. Okay, uh, basically prefix and sequence number. Then they attach this digest to their uh, sync prefix, just like in this example. So the last component of the sync message is basically the root digest here. Okay? So each of them just sends this sync interest with the root digest from their viewpoint. Okay. Then they exchange, they send each other this message. If everyone has the same set of data, then they will have exactly the same root digest, right? So in this example, in the first picture, we have the blue uh, messages. They're the sync interest. 
every one of them has divergence zero. That's the uh, latest state. So it's kind of a stable state. However, node A started generating new data. So it's, once it generates new data, it's going to send a sync reply to all the sync interests that it has received. Okay, remember one data packet for every sync uh, interest. So this sync reply will arrive at both B and C, basically telling them I have A has generated a new piece of data with that particular name, maybe uh, slash A sequence number uh, 101. Okay, and then this sync reply will reach B and C. They will know uh, A has a new piece of data I'm supposed to fetch. Okay, so both of them will update their digest. So remember the digest is computed over all these leads, right? So if node A has generated new data, this 100 becomes 101, and they're going to have a new hash or a new digest on the top. Okay, so um, each of them, B and C, will uh, update their own digest tree, and they will compute a new digest, digest one. And this, after this, they can decide whether to fetch that new piece of data slash A slash 101 or not. Most likely they will, because in the example I'm giving uh, in chat, you do want to get every piece of data everybody else has produced. You don't want to see some missing chat, chat messages, right? That is hard to understand if you're missing some chat messages. So in this part of the example, they, they do want everybody else's message, but in another application, maybe they don't. So um, in Chronosync's case, all it does is to inform the application slash A has a new piece of data, slash A slash 101. It's the application's decision whether to retrieve it or not. So um, in, on the right side of the picture, you can see that after each of them updates their own digest, they will send each other uh, the new sync interest with the digest one attached to the end. Then they all reach a stable state. Nobody is producing new data, and there's um, the interest will be waiting for new data at A, B, and C. Okay, so that's the new steady state. This is how chronosync works. It's um, it's the basis for uh, many other sync protocols we have designed afterwards. But there is a small uh, limitation. That is, um, this root digest is simply a hash. And by just looking at the hash, if you have two hashes, you cannot tell exactly uh, what uh, leaf they're missing, right? By just comparing two random hash, hash numbers. So that's one uh, limitation of uh, promising. What they do is they actually need to look at uh, their records to see um, how the other side may have arrived at that digest number. And then using its log to decide, maybe the other side is missing this piece of data, and then send them as a result, as a reply. Now, that may not work all the time. So for example, if they receive data in different orders, then their records will not match, okay? So in that case, uh, that way of detecting the difference will not work. They have to resort to um, a, a longer recovery process. And that is undesirable in a mobile ad hoc environment. So this, is, this will work under normal conditions, but if you have a very um, 
a highly dynamic environment, like a mobile iPod network, then um, trying to figure out what the other side is missing is difficult here uh, with these hashes. So we need to think more how are we going to design a uh, sync for an environment where um, the connections are short-lived or the connectivity is short-lived and um, they're all continuously moving. Um, so uh, this is a, a design that um, came up after looking at different potential ways to design sync protocols. Um, the, this, um, the new um, digest, or we can call it a digest, but it's not really a hash. The new form of digest is called a state vector. So it simply lists all the um, node names and their sequence numbers. So instead of calculating this uh, hash on top of these leads, you don't need to do that. So you could just list these uh, node names and their sequence numbers. This is very straightforward, right? When you, whenever you receive something like this, you can instantly tell what the other side is missing or what I'm missing, right? Then this is a very straightforward way for you to compare the data set between two nodes. And this state vector is carried in the single interest instead of a hash. And then um, whenever you generate some new data, you update the state vector, and then you send the new state vector out. And whoever receives it compares uh, their own state vector with your state vector, and they can tell the differences uh, immediately. Then they can request any missing data. Um, in addition, because in a mobile ad hoc environment, these same interests may get lost, right? And so these nodes will periodically transmit the same interests in case um, the other nodes may miss the same interest when it was first generated. There could be also new nodes joining the group, right? They may have missed the same interest you have sent before. So this periodic transmission will handle all kinds of um, problems, okay? And another issue that was discovered during the um, uh, evaluation of the new sync protocol is that sometimes the sync state doesn't match the data set you get, you have. So especially in a highly dynamic environment, uh, in this example, uh, you can see we have a node A, node B, and node C. Node A has uh, A6, B3, and C4. So this is the set of data A has. So then A uses the sync protocol to propagate its own state. Now B receives the state. B is going to update its own vector to A6, C3, and C4, and then try to fetch the missing data, which is A4, A5, A6. Right? However, before A actually finishes uh, fetching all the data, they are disconnected. So B never gets to finish uh, updating the, its data set to be consistent with the new state it has. Okay, at this time, it has a, B has already further propagated its vector to C. C will also have A6, C3, and C4, and C will try to fetch A4, A5, and A6, but B has no data for C, right? Because B will, is disconnected from A. So in this situation, the state actually gets propagated faster than the actual data. And you can have this kind of situation very often in a um, highly disconnected network. 
So the lesson here is that you cannot completely separate the state synchronization and data synchronization in this kind of environment like we were doing in Kronos. So we need to put extra uh, consideration into uh, how to uh, sync the state in this environment. Uh, what we need to do here is actually couple the state synchronization and data synchronization a little more closely than a little more tightly than what we do for the chromosync protocol. So that's one thing. The other thing that will also help is to engineer more um, data repositories into the network to increase the data availability. So remember, um, most of, I mean, what we have been talking about is um, opportunistic data storage, which is a content cache. The, the, the content cache, they may or may not have the data you want. They may purge to uh, include more, to, to accept more data. And what you want may not be the content store. So a way to increase the data availability is to add more data repositories. We call them persistent data storage, MDN. And we have something called data repo that does the persistent storage. And once you have those data repos, um, C, for example, may be able to get a copy of A4 from that repo. And one place you can put the data repo is the, um, the nodes that are aggregators of data. For example, the carrier, or the UAV, or the Wi-Fi access point deployed uh, in the field. They, they can serve as a permanent storage for, um, for the uh, nodes participating in this um, environment. Okay, so that's what I want to say about how you can, um, how you can um, engineer the sync protocol to handle a more mobile or more dynamic environment. But the basic um, steps are very similar. You basically uh, represent the data set using a compact format over the data names. Then you exchange the data set state to detect the missing data names. And all that is implemented in what we call sync libraries. And the applications just simply include the library, they create a sync socket or something like that, and then they can um, just uh, get notified whenever there is new data produced in the group they're interested in. It's very convenient for the applications. And if you want to know more details about the different types of sync protocols we have designed, um, to, tomorrow I will give um, another technical talk about sync um, in one of the afternoon sessions. The paper is a brief introduction to NBN dataset synchronization.